so this was actually the third try from Warner Brothers with this movie. And uh, third time's a charm, I guess, in this case, right? <laughs> yes, this very was, much so. Yeah, this is considered uh, one of the first, if not the first, film noir. Um, it's the directorial debut of um, uh, John Huston and uh, the um, acting debut of Sidney Greenstreet. And it was a star making role for um, Humphrey Bogart. So a lot going on with this movie. It's also considered um, one of the greatest film noirs ever made, um, the greatest detective movie ever made. Um, it's the introduction to Sam Spade, who uh, infamous character who's been in so many different uh, detective movies. Um, it, there's been a lot of praise heaped on this film. After rewatching it, do you think it's well deserved? Absolutely. Um, when you look at it in historical context, this this film is truly groundbreaking because uh, Houston, for one thing, insisted on keeping the character hard and cynical, and that was important. Um, it was true to the novel, and uh, a very important concession as far as Hollywood went, because the Hayes office actually wanted them to wanted him to eliminate drinking from the uh, from the movie, and he said, "Absolutely not. Um, this is a hard drinking detective who uh, has a very cold, calculating outlook about things." So it's consistent with the character and it kind of really sets the template in a way for movies to come. I mean, even Philip Marlowe isn't as cold and calculating as Sam Spade. Philip Marlowe is a man who walks down the mean streets, but is not himself mean. He's a white knight, as opposed to Sam Spade, who is entirely looking out for himself. <laughs> And with Marlowe, you're talking about another classic uh, detective. Right, right. I'm just comparing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just so, I mean, he for those really, really embodies the anti-hero that um, Hollywood would never have embraced before in any way. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he does a lot of dark things that you wouldn't expect from the hero of your story. Um, yeah, I, as I mentioned before, this is the directorial debut of John Huston. Um, he did a lot of writing and some acting before this. Uh, the first screenplay he did that was turned into a movie was in 23, and this was 41. So he was in the business for a while, even though he wasn't like, you know, directing movies. He was still in and around the business for a while. Um, so he was biting his teeth um, in Warner Brothers. Uh, the biggest thing he did prior to this, I think, was writing Jezebel which was Warner Brothers' answer for uh, Gone with the Wind. Uh, it was kind of like a make good for Betty Davis because she wanted the role of Scar Scarlett O'Hare. Um, I thought that movie was pretty good. I'm not a huge fan of either of those movies um, mm -hmm. because of the racial kind of tension in there, but um, th they were definitely- I've actually never seen it, so. <laughs> you never seen Eat Jezebel or either? I've, seen, I've never seen Jezebel. Okay. Yeah, I'm a huge uh, Betty Davis fan. She's my favorite actress. So I've seen most of her work. I didn't see Satan Metal Lady, which was one of the um, other two adaptations yeah, of it's... this. She was in that, but I haven't seen it. Uh huh. It was not very good. Yeah, that's <laughs> I didn't why tell I kinda... you that much. <laughs> You've seen it, I'm assuming. Then I have seen it. I've seen all three versions, and the third version is definitely the version <laughs> to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, about, <laughs> I thought about watching it, but I was like, ah, why do it to myself? They, <laughs> just to make like a reference of like a, for like two seconds in this review, I didn't want to watch like two bad movies. So I was like, I'll pass. So. Good idea. I mean, yeah. really, life's too short. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned before, Sydney Green Street made his debut in this. This was considered a star making turn for um, Humphrey Bogart because um, he much like Houston was around for a while making a lot of movies, but he didn't really establish himself as like the leading man. He had a few really good performance alongside James Cagney, who was one of my favorite actors. And I like James Cagney more than I like Bogart, but I do have to admit in the movies they made together, Bogart more than held his own. 
And that was before Bogart was even established as a star. He was just like the sidekick or like the heavy. Mm -hmm. And he he held his own. It, it's not just that you're holding your own against another great actor in Cagney. You're holding your own against an actor that chooses scenery and that has so much charisma in Cagney, which mm -hmm. is why I love him. I love actors that chew the scenery. Um, Cagney, Davis, uh, Jack Nicholson, actors like that. I just love them. And Bogart. Joan Crawford? <laughs> she definitely chews. She definitely chews. The scenery. I love her. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't. Uh, that, that. Ever since She's, Mildred Pierce, I've loved her. <laughs> She's a good one. She's not one of my favorites, but I did like her and um, Davis playing off against each other in um, Hush, no, no, Hush, Hush. <laughs> Whatever happened to Baby Jane. That was, that that was, was it. Me. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, a, a lot of good performances in this. And I, I thought the acting was incredible. And I was surprised there was only one Oscar nomination in the cast, and it was huh. for supporting actor for Sidney Greenstreet. Well, and I thought he was good, but I didn't look at it and think, man, if there was only one actor that got a nomination, who would it be? I wouldn't have thought him. But I guess you had to look at the competition and different things going on at the time as well. And, huh. uh, Is that the only nomination or the only win? The only nomination for an actor. For an uh, actor, oh, okay. Houston got one for the screenplay and directing as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's talk about Houston. Uh, directorial debut, prolific, um, not just for his screenwriting that we mentioned before. Um, he also wrote this as well, not just directed it. Um, acting, he uh, was in Chinatown. He did a great performance there. He was an actor throughout his career. His father, um, I thought his father was a better actor than him, but you know, he trumps him because he also wrote and directed. So um, his father also has a cameo in this as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Towards the end, he's the captain, which was a nice, fun cameo. Um, but uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on John Houston as a director? As a director, um, well, uh, he certainly was uh, true to the material, for one thing. And one thing I never really noticed until I read a Roger Ebert review about the movie is that the scene where Spade meets with um, Green Street when he meets with uh, Casper Gutman and uh, Gutman is explaining the Maltese Falcon, you know, what this thing is and how precious it is, and blah blah blah, the history. And he's explaining this, he's urging him to take a drink, and Spade never takes a drink, and then toward the end he takes a drink finally. And there's even a reference made to, I distrust a man who won't take a drink or something like that. Anyway, the thing is, the whole scene from the time Spade comes in, and they talk and they walk down the hall and they sit in a room and with the drink thing and everything. And he's drugged by the drink. That's the thing. It was a subtle touch that, um, uh, Houston put in there, and the whole scene was done in one shot. Yeah, I read that it was done in one shot, but it wasn't like um, like Orson Welles in uh, Touch of Evil, where Orson Welles had that one long shot that filmmakers right. since have emulated. Um, I've read also that it was one long seven-minute take, but it wasn't one shot. They were cutting back and forth a lot. The, the thing about this movie um, is that uh, when you look at it and you start thinking about the attributes of it, um, unlike The Third Man, which was the, the, the previous review we did, where it was a very simple story and it was just about, and it was very methodical and slow pace. This is so dense. There is so much going on in every scene. There's so much crossing and double crossing and backstabbing and lies and deceit and trickery. And it is, there's so much jam packed. This could have been a TV show, a first season of a TV show, or this could have been a trilogy of movies with the amount of material that they compacted into this one movie. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, it's just an extraordinarily well plotted. I mean, it, the plot is so complex that it's really not about plot. It's about characters basically trading lines with each other and, and erupting occasionally into violence, as they say. Um, and the dialogue just works perfectly. I mean, it's a great example of action and dialogue combined in a way that just moves the story so fast that you're not even quite sure what's going on, who you're supposed to follow, uh, who, who is this guy? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? What makes him good and bad, you know? And, you know, his goodness is the fact that he has a code that he lives by. And, you know, it's kind of what makes an anti-hero bearable for us, you know, that this person has some small shred of something in them. So to me, that's what part of what makes the movie fascinating. Yeah. And also to contrast it a little bit more with The Third Man um, is that what made the direction in Carol Reed's movie so great was his shot composition. It was a beautiful film to look at. This, on the other hand, what makes the direction great in this is the pacing. The pacing works so well. And um, the shot composition is very simple. There are only maybe like one or two really interesting shots. Other than that, it was very pedestrian. And I think that was more to focus on the acting and the pace and the actors and giving them freedom to do what they want in the scene, as opposed to like, you know, getting too clever with the camera. And I don't think that was much of um, Houston's style. Um, I, I've seen a lot of his movies. I don't remember cinematography or shot composition being a huge part of his films, making them like stand out. Um, but I definitely think the pacing was really well handled in this movie. As dense as it is, it wasn't very long. For sure, yeah, it's economical. It was very cheaply uh, filmed. And um, as I said, shot in sequence, but it was storyboarded apparently. Mm -hmm. So he planned those simple shots. Yeah. And Warner Brothers was very happy with the coupling of some of these actors. Uh, Bogart, um, Peter Lorre, and Sidney Greenstreet, a year later, would work on an even better movie together, is, mm -hmm. as hard as that, that is to believe, in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. So they loved that pairing a lot. And um, another pairing that worked out really well was Bogart and Houston. Uh, now, I've read a lot about the tensions they've had, even getting into fistfights, I think, on the set of Beat the Devil. Um, but yeah, they were, they were very contentious behind the scenes amongst, uh, uh, between the two of them. But, um, what they brought us on screen together was just amazing. And as great as this movie is, it's probably only the third best movie they made together. I would still put it behind my favorite Houston movie, which is the treasure of the Sierra Madre. And then the African queen I thought was better. They did make a lot of great movies together. I think this would be probably third, and then some of their other film noirs would probably come in just after this. Uh, Those are two what, great movies. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What did you think of their pairing and, and the, the movies they've made together as a duo? Just based on the films, you know, that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. They're fantastic. Yeah. I mean, Bogart was just an outsized personality in a way. You know, he had this kind of demeanor about him that um, these these parts really brought out that toughness, you know. And um, it would be interesting to read more about Bogart's life and figure out the ways in which Bogart and um, John Huston were similar. You know, why, why would these two people hit it off so much? And so far? I don't think reading about Bogart would do him any good in this era. <laughs> <laughs> because it, I've read a lot about Bogart and there's nothing about his personal life that would make his legend any better. Uh, <laughs> he fought with his wife. He was a wife beater. I mean, she beat him as well, but I don't think that people would care that much oh. about a woman hitting a man if a man's hitting a woman as well, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, he had a lot of physical fistfights 
um, with brutal ones with his first wife, I think, or yeah, either his first or his second. He was married several times. He was a heavy drinker. Um, he he hooked up with um, uh, Lauren Bacall. I think she was a teenager when they got together. And there was a huge age gap between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Again, something that wouldn't be looked upon very well in this in this. Well, oh, I'm not saying he's a, a role model. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not accusing you. Of that. I'm just saying, like, if you were saying, if you, it'd be interesting to read up more about him. I'm saying, like, if people read up more about him, it may actually it might, detract really. <laughs> from their opinion of him. So yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, you want to go through the movie a little bit? Sure. Okay, yeah, so we, we open up with um, O'Shaughnessy hiring Spade and Archer to follow Thursby. And she comes up with a bogus story for them to get them on the track. Now, I did read the book as well. Did you read the book or no? Oh, yeah, I've read the book. Okay. It's been a once. long, okay, awesome. <laughs> Maybe your memory will be a little bit fresher than mine. All I remember no, from I the book is that um, there was a lot more backstory to the characters. Um, including the affair with the wife and different and the, his relationship with the cops. The world was more built in the books. But aside from that, I don't remember a lot of differences with how the story played out. I just remember there was more detailed, like you felt like you were in the world of Spade more. Like there was, this was like a city that like he, he like, I don't know, the city was more of a character to me in the books in that like, his relationships with everyone in it was more developed and him moving around it felt a little bit more real as opposed to just going from, you know, three or four different set pieces in the movie, you know? There mm -hmm. wasn't really any like city shots established of them maneuvering about in the city. This felt pretty much like, like I said, visually cinematography wise, there wasn't a lot to it. The shot composition, there wasn't a lot to it. And the location wise, there wasn't a lot to this movie as well. It was just like three or four different rooms that they would bounce from in and out. And the mm -hmm. book kind of like established more of like a, a um, atmosphere and more character development. But aside from that, I think they stayed pretty loyal from my memory of it. If they depart any, you can just bring it up as I, as I break down um, some of what happens here. Um, but yeah, I, I, she puts them on the trail of Thursby. Um, now, interesting enough, Spade could have been the one that was killed because he was the one talking to her. If his partner didn't come in, Archer mm -hmm. didn't come in and, you know, literally take the bullet for him, you know, this could have been the, played out very differently. So, exactly. um, yeah. So Miles is killed, Thursby is killed, and um, we establish quickly Spade's relationship with the cops. Like, they, they seem to have a past with each other, you know. Um, it's almost like it, it, in other movies, there's a good cop, bad cop. In this movie, there's the cop that likes Spade and the cop that doesn't. I think it's Detective Tom that likes him and Lieutenant Dundee that doesn't. They at least made some attempt to make the cops a little bit different from each other. Um, oh, yeah. So their, their interaction was more interesting. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they think that Spade killed Thursby in retaliation for um, his partner being killed. It's quickly established that Spade isn't broken up by his partner's death. Oh, uh, have Miles' desk move out of the office and have Spade and Archer taken off all the doors and windows and uh, have Samuel Spade put on. Because he's like, hey, take his name off the, take his mm -hmm. name off everything. <laughs> this, is, right. this is Spade's detective agency now, um, which is a little bit callous, but he kind of makes up, yeah, he kind of <laughs> makes up for it a little bit at the end, but it does seem callous. Um, now you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do remember the, the, um, Archer's wife, Eva, being more mm -hmm. established in the books than she is here. In here, there's just a couple of scenes of her stalking and following Spade. Um, she was more of a character in the books, right? Yeah, maybe a bit, but not much more. It yeah. really seemed to be more about, um, Spade's, um, Total disregard for her, basically. She's in there. I told you to keep her away from me. Yes, but you didn't tell me how. Oh, don't be cranky with me, Sam. I've had her all night. Sorry, Angel. I didn't mean it. He's real callous. And, you know, he was pretty callous in the book, too. So it's kind of like she gets some attention, but 
I don't feel like she really was much more than an annoyance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, the amount of screen time she got in the in the movie was just enough. We mm-hmm. didn't need more of her. W- 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 what was meant to be established was established in the amount of screen time she got. I was just curious if my memory failed me, but I guess no, I maybe she so. wasn't more of a character. Okay. I don't um, think so, but I'm, I could be wrong. It's been okay. a while. Okay. But yeah, basically we establish with the changing of the name of the detective agency from Spade and Archer to just Spade, um, establishing that Spade was sleeping with Archer's wife. There were things done to show that, hey, this guy isn't your typical hero. Um, and he's not too broken up by his partner being gone. And you're right, that poor woman. Uh, you, you said <laughs> poor woman. She was sleeping with her, yeah. her husband's partner. So she's not completely innocent, but the no. way she's treated is just so... Be kind to me, Sam. Ha! You killed my husband, Sam. Be kind to me. <laughs> That's really terrible. Even the secretary didn't have any empathy for her at all. How did you and the widow make out? She thinks I shot Miles. So you could marry her? He wasn't like, hey, like, you know, we're women, let's stick together, or anything like that, you know? And well, she kind of tries. But not really. Not much, not much. She, in she fact, did. she's really, I see Effie Moore as this kind of like female guy to Sam. I mean, to Sam, Effie is like just another pal. And what's interesting, it also establishes not just Spade's relationship with Archer and his personality, it also establishes Effie because mm-hmm. it was clear that she was aware of the affair, which is kind of interesting because. They're both her bosses, and she's a, she was aware that one boss was sleeping with the other's wife. So you kind of wonder, what was the relationship with Effie and Spade like that, she would, that he would let her know about it, or that she would find out about it on her own, and that she wouldn't feel any conflict of interest or conflict of conscience, you know? in dealing with that situation. So I thought that was that was interesting. Then we have Cairo hires Spade to find the Falcon, but not before it's established that neither of them trust each other um, as they get into a fist fight and um, Cairo pulls the gun on him and searches his office. Uh, we see that Cook is following Spade. Eva is following Spade as well, which is uh, Archer's wife. The web of lies and misinformation continues. Um, But we do finally establish the Falcon as being like the MacGuffin or the thing that they're Mm -hmm. all after. Um, O'Shaughnessy, um, I thought she had a, she had a great scene with the the O'Shaughnessy character, but Mary Astor, the actress, she has this great scene. And this is where um, Cairo, uh, Spade and O'Shaughnessy are in uh, Spade's apartment and they're together for the first time. Uh, there are two things she does after the cops show up um, to Spade's place that I thought was amazing subtlety by the actress. Um, one is uh, she hits Cairo, which makes him scream for help, and the cops come into Spade's apartment. And then Spade starts weaving this lie that gets the <laughs> cops going. And she just looks at him and smiles in like admiration. It's like, it's like he, she is such a degenerate in a way that she is aroused and turned on by his level of deceit and cunningness. You mm-hmm. know, that's, that's, that's attractive to her. And that mm-hmm. smile just said so much. <laughs> and it wasn't even like the camera was focused on her. Like it was like this big intended thing. It was more so like a wide shot over Bogart's shoulder, and you just see her looking up, smiling, like so happy, <laughs> weaving this incredible lie. And I just thought that was just such nice subtlety by her. And also, um, when uh, Cairo starts talking, she goes up to him and starts swinging at him, and then the cops start breaking them apart, and then she just kicks him. He's trapped me with a fist. Why don't you make him tell the truth? I know, I love that part. <laughs> I love the kick. Uh, 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 it's 
seemed like <laughs> like something like you know you would ad lib or something like that. Maybe it was part of the script. But to me, the kick at the end was just beautiful. I know. It almost felt real. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was part of this. Maybe it was all <laughs> intended. Maybe they did it every take. But it just felt like she was like, oh, just let me throw that in there, you know, <laughs> just for good measure. Like, I like I really don't like this guy, you know? So <laughs> yeah. um, I thought that was a great scene by her. I thought she was great in the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the part also where... Um, She's wandering around the apartment and um, he makes a comment about that. I think you can stop wandering around for a moment. Uh, you know, are you going to poke around in the fireplace some more? <laughs> yeah, because she started wandering around the apartment making up lies. Then yes, he caught her in a yes. lie. Uh -huh. And then when she started to stutter, he was like, well, do you want to walk around more and make up with some other <laughs> yeah, lies? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I saw Joel Cairo tonight. Do you know him? Only slightly. You're good. You're very good. What did he say? About what? About me? Nothing. What did you talk about then? He offered me $5,000 for the black bird. Uh, uh, you're not going to go around the room straightening things and poking the fire again, are you? Yeah. Yeah. The dialogue in this was so good. It it's was just so, so good. It's just so I think a lot of it was from the book, too, as well. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was great dialogue. The script was just 10 out of 10. Um, <laughs> then we get Gutman, who does some exposition. And uh, we see the bad guys get the upper hand on Spade for the first time. And that was a scene that we talked about previously, where they get him to drink the drink and knock him out. And there was another great thing I loved in that once Bogart was already down on the ground and it was clear he was about to just pass out yeah. on his own. They didn't have to do anything. Cook who was super annoyed by, um, by Spade's character, he just kicks him in the head for good measure. And I thought yeah. that was great as well. <laughs> yeah, you can almost feel that kick. I mean, yeah. it's like, oh. Yeah, and especially what we know about head trauma now, just to like give him a concussion on top of like knocking him out with the spiked drink, I thought was a great touch because that Cook character was being taken advantage of up until that time and after that by um, Bogart, um, which was good that they got a guy smaller than Bogart that he could bully around because Bogart <laughs> was infinitely not that tall and he used to wear lifts in his shoes to make mm -hmm. him seem taller. But they did do a good job here of surrounding him with all shorter actors with the exception of the two, de the detective and the, uh, the two detectives um, or the lieutenant and the detective. Um, all the other characters were shorter than Bogart, including Cook, who was technically supposed to be playing a tough guy, uh, but he was really tiny and getting bullied a lot. So him kicking him, Bogart in the head was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> in that, in that. It was, yeah, yeah. And it's really funny when he gets up and he looks in the mirror, there's no bruise or anything on his face. <laughs> That's I the think thing that was more gets me about these old movies. <laughs> it, yeah, it was it was more like the Hayes Code and and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, uh, we get the scene where we finally get all of our characters together, all of our like major scumbags, all in one room, <laughs> and it was a pretty. It was almost like the third act of the movie was just all them in a room together, which you would think wouldn't be that interesting, but the movie had established each of them with Spade one on one establishing their personalities and how cunning and deceptive they all are. And then to see them all in that one room at the end, that scene could have worn on another 20 minutes and I would have been happy. It was just great. The acting and the way that uh, Spade would try to get them to turn on each other and get them to like give up Cook, get them to admit who killed who. Because as dark as the character was, Ultimately, he was just trying to figure out who did what and turn them all in. In the exactly. end, he didn't take any of the money. He didn't take the Falcon. He didn't let anyone off the hook. He turned mm -hmm. everyone in. So as dark as the character was, he did have some, redeem some redeeming qualities towards the end. Um, but that, yeah. yeah, but that ending sequence was great from, uh, from them getting them to turn on Cook to um, the palming of the money um, 
you know, where they're like, hey, she, he was like, hey, don't trust O'Shaughnessy. I put, I, there's a thousand dollar bill here missing. By the way, thousand dollar bills, come on. <laughs> there's a thousand dollar bill here missing. And, uh, you know, uh, Gutman was like, hey, you know, she took it. And in spade, I think in the book, this played out a little bit longer where he made a vaccine to go to the bathroom and strip down to see if she had the money on her. I think I it did. Remember. Yeah, I think you might be right. I think it right. played out a little bit longer. They but tightened here, it up for the movie. I think they tightened it up and I think it may have been a sexual thing too for the that, time. With the very Hades much, code. yeah. I could be wrong, but I thought the scene went on a little bit longer and I thought that like maybe like Spade, you know, tried to like make her strip down to see if she had the money on her. Maybe I'm wrong. So it's possible. I think that that sounds really familiar. Yeah. It rings so, a bell. Yeah. So yeah. And they definitely would not have wanted that in the movie. No, no. Whether in that era. Whether my memory is failing me or not, they wouldn't have put it in if it was <laughs> in the book. Um, but yeah, it turns out that Gutman just palmed the thousand dollar bill. So that was that was a fun little sequence as well. I wanna know about this. You palmed it. I palmed it. Yes. Do you want to say so or do you want to stand for a frisk? Stand for? You're going to admit it or I'm going to search you? There's no third way. <laughs> I guess I believe you would. I really do. You are a character if you don't mind my saying so. You palmed it. Yes, sir. That I did. <laughs> I must have my little joke now and then. But Spade didn't fall for it. You know, our hero, smartest man in the room, uh, as always. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. And when they found out it was a fake, uh, I thought that was great, too. You saw all the characters Oh, the scene reacting. is priceless, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you didn't see it coming unless you read the book, which obviously both of us did. But um, if you didn't know it was coming, spoiler, um, it turns out that the Falcon was a fake. fake. It's a phony. It, it's lead. It's lead. It's a fake. Which was great, the reactions from them. You and your stupid attempt to buy it. Kemida found out how valuable it was. <laughs> no wonder we had such an easy time stealing it, you, you imbecile, you bloated idiot. Unlike the last movie where there were like two specific lines that stood out to me, mm -hmm. um, with this movie, there were too many. I couldn't make note. <laughs> there were just so many great lines. Obviously, the last line is the most memorable. The of stuff course. that dreams are made of. Uh, but honestly, that line is only memorable because it's the last. There's at least seven or eight great lines and maybe about 20 or 30 really good lines in this movie. Yeah. It's just amazing, the screenplay. It's just great. Or the book, I should say, because a lot of the lines came from the book. So. What I particularly like for some reason is when you're slapped, you'll take it and like it. Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> this is the second time that you have laid hands on me. When you're slapped, you'll take it and like it. The performances, the pacing, the dialogue, the plotting, it was so dense. It makes you want to rewatch it right after you just watched it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like. There's so much going on in every scene. There's very little in the terms of like budget. They did, this was a very economical movie. It's just mm -hmm. a few sets, a few rooms, and you just let the actors and the script and the dialogue take control from there.